Hi everybody, um, in this video I'm going to talk about the calculus of variations. And I'm going to start with the guy on the screen here. This is Johann Bernoulli, one of the famous Bernoulli brothers. And he was the father of Daniel Bernoulli, whose equation you've studied in your second semester of physics where you studied fluids. So the that Bernoulli equation, that's his son. He was also a great mathematician in his own right, um, a physicist before we really knew what that word was. So, and all around polymath. Now, Johann is famous for posing a a certain problem. It's one of the problems we'll talk about in the calculus of variations. The, the problem is, is this. Let's say you're in a constant gravitational field, so gravity points downward here at the surface of the Earth, and you have a point here in space, and you want to go to a lower point and now the question is, the problem is, what path could you take to go from this point to this point such that if you follow that path and it was the force of gravity pulling you down, um, you would reach the other point in the least amount of time. So you can imagine if the, these were wires and you had a bead starting here and it could go down to here, which, what type of path would you bend the wire in so that the time it took the bead to slide to the other point was the least amount of time. So it's called the brachistochrone problem. And Johann Bernoulli um, published this problem as a challenge. And it's pretty clear who he was trying to challenge when he published this. He was and he did this um, along with some friends, um, one of which is Leibniz, who founded a calculus on his own after this guy. And this is the guy that Johann and Leibniz were really challenging, um, Isaac Newton. So this was 1696. And if you see here, Isaac Newton was born in 1643. Uh, a little over 20 years older than Johann. Uh, Johann was born about the time that uh, Isaac Newton was discovering calculus. Okay, And 1696, Isaac Newton was working in the Met at the Tower of London. He was an old man by this time. Um, I think by this time he was master of the mint. He started as warden of the mint and he took charge re, charge of uh, England, England's recoinage and I think he was master of the mint by 1696. He had published the Principia. He was famous and Johann and Leibniz and their followers thought that Einstein or <laughs> Leibniz and Johann Bernoulli and their followers thought that Newton was not as good at calculus as everyone thought he should be as one of the inventors of calculus. So they posed this problem. Um, now I think Leibniz uh, sent a solution in. It took him a while to do it. Um, and they published this problem in a journal, and they sent this to Isaac Newton. So the story is comes. The story comes from his niece, who lived with him at the time. Said he got this in his mail. He came home late from the Tower of London, was tired, looked at the mail, saw this problem, realized it for what it was. You know, Newton was very very smart. And you know, with a sigh. There was actually three problems. The Brachistochrone problem was one of these. And I mean, with a sigh, Newton um, sat down and decided to tackle it. 
and he worked on it all night. And by morning, he had finished all three problems, and he sent them in. And when Bernoulli saw the solutions, you know, Newton didn't even bother to sign his name. And Bernoulli said something to the effect, well, you know, this is the mark of the lion. Um, so, you know, Newton was as good as everybody said he was. So the Perkistochrome problem is one of the problems that we'll, we'll talk about um, and do the solution to. Now, it was later somebody who was actually a student of Bernoulli's that um, sort of took these type of problems that we now call the calculus of variation problems and systemized how to do them. And that is, oops, sorry, that is Leonard Euler. Um, so Euler was at one time a student of Bernoulli's. You can see he was born in 1701. Bernoulli lived to 1748. Um, these guys all lived to old age for that time in their 80s. Newton, Bernoulli, Euler. Um, of course, Euler has a large number of things um, to his name. He was, I think he was probably the second most proficient mathematician. Um, that there ever was, but yeah, you know he has a lot of things called the Euler equation. We will study the Euler equation um, in in this video. That's what one of the things we'll drive here, and then we'll do a a problem with it. So that's where we're going. Okay, so. I've mentioned the perkistochrome problem. Um, Perkisto means shortest, and this is time. Oops, sorry. Um, so that's one problem. Here's another problem that we'll do. It's called Fermat's principle. And in this problem, it's, this is the way I like to state it, and this is not my formulation of it, but I like this. So you have two points, point one and point two here. Now let's say you're a lifeguard and you're here, and this is sand. So we'll specify sand, it has a certain value um, that tells us how fast we can go into that, let's say relative to whether if you were on concrete or something. And over here is water. And at point two, there's somebody drowning and you're the lifeguard and you wanna get there. So it has a number associated with the water, again, tells you how fast you can go in the water relative to, say, running on, on concrete. So you have sand, you have water. You can go faster on sand than you can go on water. So the question is, what path do you take to get here in the shortest amount of time? Do you go straight down in the sand, cover the shortest distance in the sand, and then go out here? Or do you go the longest distance in the sand and go straight in the water, the shortest distance of the water, or is there some kind of in-between path? What path will get you there in the shortest amount of time, knowing you go at different speeds on this side of the boundary and this side of the boundary? So that's Fermat's principle. Um, his principle is that you will take the path that will give you the shortest amount of time, and our question is, what is that path? So you might realize that this is, um, I think what Fermat really said was light will travel from one material to the other in the, on the, along the path that gives us the shortest amount of time for the light to travel. So from this, we'll derive Snell's law. But we'll do that next time. The other problem that we'll talk about, and this one we will look at in this video, um, is an easy problem to state, it's just the shortest distance between two points. What is the shortest distance between two points in a plane? So let's say I have, in two dimensions, 
point one and point two is the shortest point <laughs> distance and actually just a, a line. So do you get an equation for the line for that? And let's kind of set up how you would do this type of problem. So we could go on this path, but whatever path we take, we when we go a short distance, we'll call that ds. So ds is just a very short part of the path. Now, I'll draw ds over here. So if this is x and this is our y coordinate, dx, ds is you go a little bit in the x direction and a little bit in the y direction. ds squared is dx squared plus dy squared. Okay. Now, I'm going to go from point 1 to point 2, and I'm, this is the thing I'm going to want to minimize. I'll call this j. So I want to minimize this integral from 1 to 2. Um, but notice now I can write ds as the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. And then I can also rewrite this as this. Oops. Integral 1 to 2. Um, oops. Sorry. Okay, the integral from 1 to 2. Um, I'm going to divide both sides by um, dx, but I have to multiply by dx too, so I'm going to get this. Um, 1, because I'm going to... Basically, I'm going to divide both sides by this and multiply both sides by that. So I get 1 plus dy dx squared. And then I got my dx here. That's the square root of dx squared. So I rewrite j is equal to Now I'm going to write y prime is dy dx. So I'll write this as Okay, so this is the thing we want to minimize because that's the path length. And we want to find out if the path length will give us the shortest j there is equal, looks like this. Okay. So... What we find is this. We have, thanks to Euler, we can have a standard way to approach this problem. So I'm going to rewrite what I had there. So in general, when we're doing a problem like this, we have a function in here that's a function of y and maybe the derivative of y. Those are the dependent values and the independent value is x. So I'll write it like that in here. And we call this a functional. And again, y and y prime are the dependent variables in this. And uh, x is the independent. So it turns out we can write what we want to minimize as an integral. And in here we have a function of y and its derivative, 
and then the independent variable. That's exactly what we have up here. We have this written as a function, in this case, of just y prime. Okay? So if we can write what we want to minimize, like this, then what do we do? Okay? So when we're confronted with trying to find a curve, y, that will minimize j, um, we're going to start by assuming a, some kind of trial curve. So we're going to assume trial curve. And I'll call it big Y. And it's going to be a, a parameterized uh, function. So we're going to have X and alpha. It's going to be a function of those. So we're going to say, Look, our trial curve, whatever it is from here to here, maybe it looks like this, it would be a deviation from probably what the true curve would be. We're going to assume it's not a huge deviation. that We can guess pretty close. So this would be our, our true curve that will minimize J. And then we have some coefficient here, alpha times some other function. It could be like this. This could be the true curve, a straight line. And maybe n sub x is sine of x. Or something like that. So the point is, is that we think we can write our, our guess as a combination of the true function plus maybe some other function here. Okay, this could be a constant. Um, so, again, what we're now trying to minimize using our trial is this. Uh, F, the, the functional, is a function of Y, big Y now, and big Y prime. And not only X is the independent variable, but we're going to treat alpha as an independent variable. Okay, so I, j is what I want to minimize. It has this functional in here. Um, and this is y, and it's equal to the true path that would minimize everything plus some deviation. Also notice that if I take the derivative of that with respect to x, I would get y prime of x plus alpha is a constant, so I have Okay. Now, when I take the derivative of j, so I want to minimize it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative of j with respect to alpha, this independent variable, and I'm going to find out for what value alpha will I get a minimum. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, when I take the derivative, I'm taking the derivative with respect to alpha of this functional. So let's take the derivative of this with respect to alpha. And that's going to be, because I have these two dependent variables. So I'm going to use the chain rule, and that would mean I take df dy dy d alpha plus df dy prime dy prime d alpha. That's df d alpha. using the chain rule. So I hope that's okay. Make a comment if you want me to discuss the chain rule when we have these two dependent variables. Um, 
Now notice that the partial of y with respect to alpha, that's just n of x. And I take the partial of this with respect to alpha, I'll just get this. And also the partial of y prime with respect to alpha, that's the partial of this with respect to alpha, it's just going to be n prime of x. So now my dj d alpha becomes 1 to 2, partial of f with respect to y, and then n of x plus the partial of f with respect to y prime, and then n prime of x. D okay, so now this is what I have, um, and of course I want this to equal zero. Now what I'd like to do is do something with this here because um, I'd like to have an n of x here that I could pull out. So notice this, that if I take the derivative of n of x times partial of f with respect to y prime there, that according using the product rule I get this. I leave n of x alone, take the derivative of df dy prime, plus, then I could take the derivative of this and leave df dy prime alone. So that's equal to that. Now, the other thing is when we have our, our trial path that deviates from the true path, what we do require is at the ends, the deviation is zero. So at point one here, that's zero, and at point two, it's zero. There's no deviation. We end up on the, the path. So if I take the term, this term right here, when that goes in the integral, it's going to look like this. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Not that term. <laughs> when I look at this term in the integral, so that's going to cancel that out. This is going to be n at point two df dy prime evaluated at point 0.2 minus point 0.1 evaluated at point 0.1, but this is zero and this is zero. So this term um, is gonna, I'm gonna neglect this term. So up here, this is that. I can write that n prime of x df dy prime is negative um, n of x df dy. That should be, I'm sorry, that should be prime. No, that's right. That's, oh. So if I can neglect this, then I can write that n prime of x df dy prime is equal to negative n of x d dx df dy prime. So I go back up to my integral, dj d alpha is equal to from 1 to 2. Now that has an nx up here. I'm going to pull that out. So I'll have df d big y. And then I'll have minus now, because I'm going to replace that with this minus. And I'm going to pull out the nx. So I'll have this left partial of f respect to y prime. Here's the nx, then I have dx. So that's what I have, equals zero. 
Now, this is not necessarily zero, not zero in general, as we do this integral. So I add up all the little increments dx as I go through this integration. It has to always add up to zero. That'll happen if this is equal to zero. So this is Euler's equation. Now, this is needed to make J a minimum, but it's not um, sufficient to say you do get a minimum. So we would say that this is necessary but not sufficient to get a minimum J. Okay. Now, one other thing that I, I need to say is that um, assume when alpha goes to zero, which we're doing, assume when alpha approaches zero, that if I take the derivative of f with respect to big Y, that's the same as taking the derivative of f with respect to little y, remember? because big Y is little y plus alpha n. And also we assume that the derivative of f, partial derivative with respect to y prime is the same as the partial of f with respect to little y prime when alpha goes to zero. Okay? So now that means we can rewrite the Euler condition, the Euler equation as the partial of f with respect to little y now instead of big Y minus d dx partial derivative with respect to little y prime equals zero. And that's what we're going to call the Euler equation. So what we do is we set up our integral, we identify the functional J is what we want to minimize. So if we can write J like this and identify a functional, then we use Euler's equation and try to see what that tells us about Y. So let's try an example. So let's go back and let's look at the problem we had going from point one to point two in a plane. So our problem is show that shortest distance between two points in a plane is given by y equals mx plus b. Now this is really not exciting, but it shows how, how we do this. So we had this, j equals, going from point one to point two, square root of one minus y prime squared dx. Okay. So f, our f, and it's going to be y, y prime, and x is equal to the square root of 1 minus y prime squared. So we try to write what's in this integral in terms of y and y prime. So then our condition would be we need the partial of f with respect to our y minus d dx partial of f with respect to y prime to be zero. Okay. Well, if I look at the partial of f with respect to y, there is no y in here, so that's just equal to zero. 
So this term is zero already. If I look at the partial of f with respect to y prime, I take the derivative of that, I get a one half, one minus y prime squared to the negative one half, and then I take the derivative of what's inside there, I get negative two y prime. So that's equal to negative y prime over the square root of one minus y prime squared. Okay, and then I gotta take the derivative with respect to x of that. And that has to be zero according to this because this is equal to zero. So let's go to the next. So if that's equal to zero, then y prime over the square root of one minus y prime squared has to be a constant. Which of course implies that y prime is a constant. Okay, so if y prime is a constant, Um, then we have integrate from 1 to 2 anyway we get cx plus a constant of integration so there you go so y equals cx plus b 